Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Hepatitis E Virus, the Need for Improved Testing. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Diasorin. To learn more, visit diasorin.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Jacques Isopet, Professor of Virology, Faculty of Medicine, Toulouse-Propan, France, and Florence Abravenel, MCU-PH, Faculty of Medicine, Toulouse-Propan, France. Jacques and Florence, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank Diasorin for organizing this seminar. Uh, Florence and, and myself are very happy to share with you a recent advance on hepatitis E uh, virus, particularly in the field of serologic diagnosis with a new automated system launched by uh, Diasorin. Hepatitis E virus is a small naked virus, 27 to 34 nanometer. The capsid is ecozydric. And the genome is a single-stranded uh, positive RNA, 7.2 kilobase, uh, with three open reading frame, ORF1, ORF2, uh, and ORF3. There is a, a fourth ORF uh, that is uh, overlapping ORF1 for certain strain belonging to one specific genotype, genotype 1. This virus belongs to the Epiviridae family, uh, and this family contains two genus, Sortoepivirus and PC epivirus. Uh, the genus Sortoepivirus contains four species, Sortoepivirus A, B, C, and D. And the strains that can be transmitted to, to human belongs mainly to Sortoepivirus A species, uh, containing eight genotypes. Uh, and only one serotype, but also uh, to Autoepivirus C. Uh, and uh, the main genotypes are genotype 1, 2, 4. These genotypes are uh, uh, located uh, in different parts of the world. As you can see here, genotype 1 and 2 uh, are found in uh, um, low-income uh, countries, and they are strictly found in, in human. Uh, and these genotypes are transmitted uh, via contaminated water. Uh, and genotype 3 and 4 are found outside this uh, area uh, in many parts of the world, uh, mainly Asia for genotype 4 and in the other parts of the world for genotype 3. Genotypes 3 and 4 are zoonotic, and this is important. There is a large animal reservoir, mainly constituted by uh, pigs, a wild boar, uh, and, and also deer and, and rabbit. Uh, this uh, publication ranked the risk of animal to human spillover. And you can see here that uh, hepatitis E uh, virus is uh, uh, among the 10, uh, top 10 uh, pathogens, uh, as you can see, just after uh, Seoul virus and Nipah virus. An important characteristic of this virus is a quasi-enveloped virus. This virus uh, circulates in the blood with a lipid envelope and uh, uh, when the, the virus reaches the, the bile, uh, the envelope is destroyed by uh, the uh, pancreatic uh, um, 
uh, enzymes, uh, and also by the uh, deoxycholic acid. So the virus that is found in the intestinal tract is a naked virus. This envelope plays an important role for cell entry, uh, tissular tropism, and infectivity. But also, this envelope allows the virus to escape to neutralizing antibodies. The HEV life cycle is uh, <coughs> shown here. Uh, besides the virus that is produced at the uh, apical and at the basolateral side of the hepatocyte, uh, the capsid protein can be secreted as a free form uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the blood and also in the, in the bile. Uh, we recently demonstrated that this virus can replicate in the intestinal uh, tract uh, by using uh, primary intestinal cells uh, and also human intestinal tissues. And so uh, we propose uh, a new concept that uh, the virus replicates in the intestine and then reach uh, the bile as an enveloped uh, form and this enveloped virus infect the hepatocytes. There are in fact two epidemiological and clinical entities, uh, genotype 1 and 2, that are strictly found in humans, uh, infect uh, young adults uh, and they uh, can induce fulminant hepatitis in pregnant women and in patients with uh, pre-existing liver disease. But these genotypes cannot uh, induce chronic infection. Uh, genotype 3 to 8, and mainly genotype 3 and 4, uh, uh, induce acute hepatitis in adults older than 55. Uh, they induce fulminant hepatitis, but only in patients with pre-existing liver disease. Uh, and these genotypes can induce chronic infection in immunocompromised patients. Uh, it is important to underline that uh, all these genotypes give frequent, very frequent asymptomatic infections. A particular uh, point, uh, interesting point is the uh, uh, pathogenicity of hepatitis E virus uh, uh, during the pregnancy. And uh, our recent study showed that, uh, in fact, uh, this pathogenicity is genotype dependent. And genotype 1 uh, uh, induce uh, on uh, the uh, using placental tissue, we show that uh, genotype 1 induce uh, high level of replication, uh, tissue necrosis and apoptosis, and a very specific uh, profile of cytokine that is very different of what is found for uh, HIV genotype 3. Uh, with HIV genotype 3, the level of replication is very low uh, the, and there is no tissue necrosis and uh, no apoptosis. And, and the cytokine profile is uh, completely different uh, uh, compared to uh, HIV genotype 1. And this is plain that genotype 1 and, and probably 2 are very pathogen uh, during the pregnancy. There are also neurologic manifestations for this virus. Uh, according to case report and case series, uh, so retrospectively, the uh, frequency was first estimated to be 5.5%. And the main uh, neurologic syndrome are Parsonage Turner, Guillain Barre, and encephalitis. Uh, and uh, uh, in a French prospective uh, study performed by Florence uh, several years ago, uh, in fact, the, pre the frequency was uh, higher, 16.5%, uh, and we found uh, also the same pathology, but also neuropathic pain, pain painless sensory uh, disorders. And it was interesting to, to show that uh, these neurologic manifestations were more frequent in immunocompetent patients uh, compared to immunocompromised patients. And this uh, means that probably uh, um, uh, immunologic mechanisms are involved uh, in the pathogenicity of the, of the virus. Nevertheless, it is possible to detect uh, uh, the virus in the CSF 
And uh, in a recent study uh, performed at Florence, we, we showed that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we can see a compartmentation uh, of the virus uh, in patients who had neurologic manifestation and a chronic infection. And in fact, uh, we can see here that the virus found in the CSF in, in uh, green, the clones uh, found in the CSF are very different to the clones found in the blood. And this is similar for this patient. Uh, an important point is the uh, uh, treatment of hepatitis E uh, and the treatment concern mainly chronic hepatitis E. And uh, uh, several years ago, in 2010, we demonstrated for the first time an antiviral effect of, the re of ribavirin. Uh, as you've shown, the ribavirin was the main treatment with interferon for hepatitis C. And uh, so uh, it's a reason why we try, we did the, this study and we showed that ribavirin in monotherapy uh, can uh, give an eradication in this series. There were eight patients and six out of eight patients were cured after three months of treatment. Uh, in fact, we uh, demonstrate, we confirm this uh, efficacy of ribavirin in a French multicentric uh, study that included 59 patients and the rate of HIV eradication after three months of uh, ribavirin in monotherapy was 78%. And more recently, in a large reopen uh, retrospective multicenter study uh, with uh, 255 uh, patients, uh, we observed the same rate of uh, eradication uh, with 81.2%. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, in fact, some of the patients were not cured up, uh, after the first line of ribavirin therapy were cured after a second course. Uh, so the, 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 the ribavirin is, is very effective. So I can uh, now... Uh, give Florence for the uh, for the, the next part of the talk. Okay, thank you, Jacques. So I will focus my, my talk on the diagnosis of hepatitis E virus infection. First, I will remind you all the markers that can be detected during the natural course of an HIV infection. As you can see, the incubation period is around two to six weeks. In uh, general, it's one month. And when it is symptomatic, we have a, a jaundice at the same time as we have the elevation of uh, ALT, the liver enzyme. But HIV RNA or HIV antigen, as uh, Jacques has just told you, we can detect also the antigen, the capsid antigen that is uh, secreted as a cerebral form in the blood. So the, all these markers can be detected in the blood or in the stool of an infected patient. And they can be detected before the, the symptomatic phase, but also for a few periods after the symptomatic uh, phase. But this uh, different viral marker doesn't last for long. And that's why the surgical markers are very important. Usually IgM are uh, positive at the acute phase of the infection and soon after we can detect IgG. So this is a natural cause for immunocompetent patients that usually clear the infection. But as Jack told you, we have chronic hepatitis E virus infection with genotype 3 and genotype 4. And in that case, the, uh, all the markers persist, HIV RNA in the blood, in the stool, and uh, HIV antigen, but also we have uh, noticed that uh, IgM are still positive during the chronic course of the infection in this patient. Uh, recently, the European Association for the Study of the Liver have uh, uh, proposed an algorithm for the diagnosis of HIV infection. And they really insist that Every patient with an elevation of liver transaminase should be tested for HIV infection, even if he has not traveled abroad for uh, European people. In immunocompetent patients, 
the diagnosis rely on the IgM and sometimes IgG, and a confirmation can be made with the HIV RNA assay. Of course, if it is positive, you can conclude that you have an acute hepatitis E, and you can screen for uh, extra hepatic manifestation, especially neurological manifestation, any risk of uh, acute and chronic liver failure, and so on. In immunocompromised patients, it's uh, very important to uh, perform both the serology and HCV RNA because this uh, serology can be uh, negative at the acute phase of the, of the infection. Of course, this patient uh, may present a risk of uh, evolution to a chronic infection, so we have to test for them for HCV RNA after three months to see if there is a viral clearance or the persistence of the virus. So, in our experience, I would say that uh, HIV IgG assays are used to see the exposure or previous or current exposure to the virus. Anti HIV IgM assays are very a uh, key marker or a uh, key uh, tool for the diagnosis of uh, acute or recent infection. Whereas uh, HIV RNA assays are here to confirm the acute infection to assess in immunocompromised patients the persistence or the clearance of immunocompromised, immunocompromised patients. And of course, it will be necessary to test for HIV RNA for the treatment follow-up when, uh, when they are given ribavirin. An alternative to PCR assay to detect HIV RNA is the possibility to detect uh, the antigen, the RF2 protein in the blood, it's not used so much in France, but it has some interest. Uh, I would like to take, uh, take your attention on the long persistence of IgM. In this uh, Spanish study, they show that the rate of detection uh, may depend on the sensitivity of the assay that you use, especially the anti-HIV IgM assay. Maybe I use, as you can see, using the microgen assay, you can detect IgM uh, in nearly 40% of the cases three years after the acute phase. It's less important with the one-time-IgM assay, but it's sometimes very difficult so to reassess uh, the importance of the, uh, this IgM, positive IgM, since the acute phase is uh, many years or many months ago. So several anti-HGM uh, ECA are now available, especially we have a rapid test or uh, well, what we call now with uh, the COVID pandemic, the lateral flow ECA. They are very rapid and very useful in a resource limited countries, for instance. They are easy to use with a visual result get in a very few minutes, but their sensitivity uh, will vary according to the ESA. It is around 90% for immunocompetent patients and 70% for immunocompromised patients. Not that they have a very excellent specificity with a very few false positive results. Microplate assay are also available with several providers that are uh, on the market now. And there have, uh, many studies have investigated their sensitivity and specificity. All of them have a very good specificity, and their specific sensitivity in immunocompetent patients range from 60 to 8, 98%, so it's quite good. But of course, it's less important in immunocompromised patients, even if we have few uh, studies that have really investigated this marker in immunocompromised patients. We have also a few automatic systems, the one by uh, Biomarier Bio on the VDAS instrument. We have evaluated this system a few years ago. It has uh, also an excellent specificity with uh, good sensitivity in uh, immunocompetent patient and less sensitive for immunocompromised patient. But uh, there are only few studies for the um, Allegria automat. 
this automat is, uh, was investigated in a few studies with small uh, number of patients, and these patients were not very well characterized. I'm not sure that they were all immunocompetent patients, but uh, its sensitivity is around 90 to 100% uh, or so. As they also found an excellent specificity, and I will go further and talk later of the new instrument that is available with the diasorin. Regarding anti-HEV ITG assay, we don't have any immunochromatographic assay available for that, but we have several microplate or automatic instruments that have developed uh, that kind of assay. But uh, the main problem of all these assays is that they present a large difference in sensitivity. By using the WHO standard, we can uh, estimate the limit of detection of all the assay, and several studies have uh, done these uh, studies. And as you can see, the limit of detection of all the different assay varies from 2.6 to 0.2 WHO international unit per ml. This large difference in uh, sensitivity has a great impact. As it has been shown in this uh, meta-analysis of anti-HIV seroprevalence in France, in uh, Europe, sorry, as you can see, uh, using different assay will give you very different uh, seroprevalence. This estimate of the seroprevalence in Europe range from 2% with the Abbott assay to 17% with the Wantai assay. And of course, it will depend also on the geographic origin of the patient and the cohort study. The one tie essay is now considered as a more sensitive essay with a limit of detection of 0.2 WHO units per ml. So I will then uh, go further with the antigen essay. There's only one available now in Europe. Uh, it has also very good specificity, 100%. And it, is, uh, it was investigated in several studies, and the sensitivity varies according to the study between 60 and 90% for immunocompetent patients, and 94% for immunocompromised patients. This essay is always less sensitive than HIV RNA essay. But there's a good correlation between the positivity of this uh, antigen essay and the PCR essay. But antigen essay are usually positive for a corresponding HIV RNA concentration of about two, three to four uh, logs copy per ml. One interesting point is that uh, this uh, antigen level uh, could be a predictive um, um, marker of the evolution of the infection in uh, immunocompromised patients, particularly in solid organ transplant recipients. We have already shown that, uh, we in German study have shown that uh, patients that will evolve to a chronic infection have higher level of this antigen in their blood. We have several molecular assays that can detect HIV RNA in the blood or in the stools of the patient. There is also a WHO standard that can be used to estimate the limit of detection of this assay. You can see here all the providers that are on the market in Europe. We have two kinds of assays, the quantitative assays and the qualitative assays. The quantitative assays have a limit of detection ranging from 20 to uh, 200, 300 uh, international units per ml. And we have also two assays that are on two instruments, a logic and a rush instrument. They have a lower limit of detection but they are only qualitative essay and they are more dedicated to the screening of blood donor to uh, test uh, the screening of blood donor as it is now recommended in several countries in Europe. A limit of uh, all the molecular essays that I have presented to you is that they do not uh, detect the uh, auto epivirus C, the species that is found in rats. 
uh, there are recent publications mainly coming from Hong Kong that have shown that this uh, species can be found also in humans. We have also performed a pilot study in more than 200 patients, but we didn't find any. But we have to keep in mind maybe that uh, this uh, virus can also be found in humans. So let me now present to you the performance of the new Murex LTV, IgG, and IgM essays that are available since a few months uh, on the diastereum instrument. They can be used on the Lyson Excel or the Lyson Excess instruments. These are two fully automated chemiluminescent immunoassays that are pro provided by diastereum for the diagnosis of hepatitis E with or without symptoms, but also intend to screen for organ tissue or uh, postmortem donors. Uh, the INT ITV ITG essay is a quantitative essay. It is uh, uh, a result is given in international unit per ml, whereas the INT ITV IGM essay is only a qualitative essay, and they can be used both on plasma and serum samples. First, we have uh, assessed the specificity of this essay by testing more than 270 uh, pa patients. Uh, this uh, patient, where well, these samples were uh, HIV negative for RNA and for antibodies by using Altona assay in PCR and Wantai assay for the serology. They came from immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients. And as you can see, the specificity of the anti IgG was very elevated with more than 99% of the samples that were negative. So it's a very excellent specificity, but it's even better for the anti-HGM uh, specificity as no sample tested positive with the liaison anti-HGM uh, HIV HGM assay. To assess the sensitivity of uh, this assay, we have tested uh, uh, 88 samples that were positive for HIV IgM using the one-tie assay, but also positive for HIV RNA. These samples were collected in immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients. In immunocompetent patients, the sensitivity of both assays are excellent. IgM and IgG were detected in all the patients. And interestingly, it is uh, even better than one-tie assay as uh, the one tie IgG essay was positive in only 91% of the patients. In immunocompromised patients, the sensitivity of the IgM essay was 93.7%, and the sensitivity of the IgG essay was 84%, uh, 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 the same, a little bit better than the one tie IgG essay. We have also tested the uh, uh, samples that were collected after the acute phase. That means that they were IgM positive using the one type test, but they were HIV RNA negative. Similarly, they were uh, tested in immunocompetent and immunocompromised patients. And in these two populations, we can see that the sensitivity of the IgM assay is a little bit less important for IgM but it's similar to the one tie essay for the detection of IgG. And it's more than 90% for IgG. And you have the, the numbers, uh, 70, um, sorry, 57% for IgM in immunocompetent patients and 71% in immunocompromised patients. Finally, we wanted also to test patients from uh, infected with non-European genotypes, I mean non-genotype 3 genotypes that we have usually in France or in Europe. That's why we have tested four samples coming from patients infected with HIV genotype 1, two samples coming from patients uh, infected with genotype 2. And uh, as you can see, all this uh, sample tested positive with the liaison and the one assay for IgG and IgM. 
Regarding genotype 4 uh, infection, we tested uh, five patients. Four out of four tested positive for both IgG and IgM with uh, liaison and one tie assays. And maybe interestingly, one patient was only positive for IgG and negative for IgM using liaison or one tie assays. This profile may suggest a reinfection in this patient. So to sum up this evaluation of the performance of the numerex assay, we can conclude that this assay has an excellent specificity for both IgG and IgM assay. We also found an excellent sensitivity in acute fast and birth, uh, particularly in uh, immunocompetent patients. The level of sensitivity also of IgG is very remarkable. That means that this assay has a very low level of a lower limit of detection. According to the package insert, it is 0.3 unit per ml. It's similar to a one tie assay. So this assay will be suitable for epidemiological study. This assay may have a lower limit of detection for long lasting IgM, IgM uh, after an acute phase, but uh, to my knowledge, it's not very necessary to have this high sensitivity several months after an acute infection. And even if you are test a limited number of different genotypes, I really uh, feel uh, confident that I think these assays have the ability to detect antibodies against the different HCV genotypes. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jacques and Florence, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is for Jacques. Is there a vaccine for hepatitis E? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Um, there is a vaccine uh, for H hepatitis E. Uh, this vaccine was developed in, in, in China uh, several years ago, and a uh, large clinical trial uh, proved uh, the efficacy of this vaccine, and the name is E. Uh, unfortunately, for now, this vaccine is restricted to, to China. The, uh, there are clinical uh, trials um, in progress, but uh, outside China, this uh, vaccine is not uh, available yet. Thank you. Our next question is for Florence. Which is the relevance of automatic systems for serology? Well, the main relevance for automatic system is the rapid uh, detection of IgM and the rapid uh, system to uh, perform a, a diagnosis of, of acute hepatitis. Especially because we are working in an hospital, it's very important to give a, a rapid answer to the clinician if it is uh, an hepatitis E or another uh, source of uh, uh, acute hepatitis for the patient. So this is very important not to perform because we are used to use a microplate assays, not to perform a uh, batch analysis, but a random access analysis. So the main relevance is the rapidity and, of course, uh, the random access of uh, these uh, automatic systems. Thank you. Our next question is for Jacques. Which kind of treatment, in addition to ribavirin, are available for HEV management? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the choice uh, of drug uh, outside ribavirin is very limited. There is, in fact, only interferon, alpha interferon that can be used in liver transplant patients in case of failure. Uh, as I mentioned, the rate of uh, uh, failure is approximately uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, after treatment with ribavirin. And for liver transplant patients, interferon can induce a cure. Uh, but uh, uh, in fact, uh, alpha interferon cannot be used in for other transplant patients due to the risk of rejection. 
uh, and is the reason why uh, there many labs work uh, to find uh, alternative therapy for in case of failure of uh, ribavirin. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. This question is for Florence. Which is the which is the importance of IgM detection in acute and post-acute phases? So for acute phases, this is a main marker that is uh, relevant for the diagnosis. Even in France, we uh, recommend only to use IgM assay to uh, detect an acute hepatitis in immunocompetent patients. HIV RNA is not necessary in this population to diagnose uh, HIV infection. So this is really the key marker for the diagnosis in immunocompetent patients, like it is for HAV infection, hepatitis A infection. Uh, it's more difficult maybe to detect and more uh, relevant to detect IgM at the post-acute phase when the liver enzymes are back to the normal. Uh, sometimes it was useful. Uh, I remember a study we performed when we have uh, studied many pa patients that have uh, participated to willing a meal, and they were tested three months after the willing meal to see if it was a, a cluster of acute hepatitis linked to this uh, meal. But um, of course, it's uh, more uh, epidemiology studies in that case than a real uh, diagnosis of acute hepatitis. So it's very important to have a very specific and sensitive assay at the acute phase. And I feel it's uh, less important to have a sensitive assay for the post-viremic phase when ALT are going back to the normal. Okay, thank you again, Jacques and Florence, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Rat Lab Roots and our sponsor, Diasorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.